Well, good morning. Hey, um, grab your Bible. Genesis chapter 32 is the bulk of where we're going to be this morning, uh, starting about verse 14. But this happens in conversations that we have with people, and uh, we don't intend for it to occur, but it just, it just kind of does, that um, you've got the best intentions in the world, you've like planned your whole speech out, you've prayed about it if you're a Christian, you know, you're like, God, please let this go great, and you, you step into the conversation to, to talk about something you know it might be a little hard, that's why you've prayed about it, that's why you've thought about it, that's why you've been super careful about it you know, the context and the place, and you get into it, and then <clears throat> something's lost in translation. It's like your wife ends up mad at you. I mean, you did, you thought, you did everything perfect. It was all set up and then like crash and burn. That's just what happened. And so we, we, have, we have this conversation with friends and with family that we want them to go really well. We have the very best intentions, nothing, nothing mean about it all. Um, and then we get into it, and then it just, it just doesn't go the way that we want it to. So that's my fear for today. Okay, um, that I have the very best intentions for everything that we're going to talk about in, in Genesis chapter 32 because it's hard, it's, it's, it's difficult. And if you don't listen, and I know there's going to be somebody, um, you're going to walk out of here thinking I said something that I did not say. You're going to walk out thinking that God is somebody that he is not. Um, but that's the risk we take because I think it's important and it's something we don't talk about very often in church. But there's a passage over in Romans 11, 33, and Paul kind of, kind of explains a little bit. This is something good for you to remember about God. He says, oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge, how impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to, needs to pay it back? And so what Paul says about God is like, you don't understand God. I mean, just God has revealed himself to us in a lot of different ways over a long period of time. And so we have in Jesus this, this sense of, of full revelation of God, but there's so much of God that we do not understand. And so he tells us, hey, listen, you're not going to understand everything God does. You're not going to understand all the decisions he makes. You're not going to understand all the ways that, that he, he does things. We're just, there's just going to be some things out there you don't know and that you don't understand. And, and I know, I know because I hear it and I've thought it too, that people like, well, you know, I don't understand why God would do that. And they get angry at God and they leave God and, you know, become an atheist or something. Um, and, and we struggle sometimes with the things that, that we look around and it's like, why did God choose to do that? But, but here, think about this just for a second. Like, do you understand everything, every decision that your wife makes? Do, do you understand every decision that your husband makes? I, I, I talk to women. They're like, I don't know why he did that. I mean, I've been living with this man for 30 years. And I, I was like, what's he thinking when he does it? I don't understand why he makes these decisions in his life. And, and it's true. And so if, we don't, if you don't understand why your wife did what she did, if you don't understand why your husband did what he did, then, then don't expect that you're going to understand everything that, that God does and why he does the things that he does. We're just not going to. And then he says that like, you, we, we're not going to know God's thoughts about things. I mean, we're not going to be able to give God advice because we don't know what he's thinking about, what's going through his mind. And, and even just take it away from husbands and wives and kids for a minute. Think about you. You know, if you've got kids, you, your, your kids do something just stupid, and you're like, why'd you do that? And what's their answer? I don't know. Right? I mean, literally, they say that, and you're like, well, well let's, let's probe a little bit. Maybe you're the counselor type. You know, let's probe a little bit. Like, well, what were you feeling? What were you thinking? I don't know. I don't know what I was feeling. I don't know what I was thinking. I just did it, you know. And, and we say that as adults, too. We're like, what were you thinking? I don't know. I just did it. So if we don't even know why we do what we do, then it, it just makes sense that we shouldn't expect to know why God does everything that he does. Correct? So let's give God a little grace, okay, because we don't understand why we make the decisions we do. We don't even understand why we do what we do. And so as we go through life and things happen in life that we don't, we don't get, just expect that that's just kind of how life goes. So you'll need to remember that in Genesis chapter 32. So let's talk about Jacob for a minute. Here's a little backstory on Jacob because it's important to what happens um, in verse 14 where God comes and picks a fight with Jacob and Jacob has to fight with him all night long until finally there's a conclusion at the end of it. So Jacob literally means heel catcher, that's what his name means, um, or deceiver, and he was those things. He was a liar, he was a thief, he was a deceiver, uh, it's just not a good guy at all. And so Jacob was a twin with Esau, his father, Abraham, his mother, Rebekah, and uh, from very early on in their lives, Jacob wanted to be first 
And he, and he went through whatever he had to go through, went, took whatever means that he could in order to try and be first. So one time Esau comes in from the field. He's famished. He's tired. He's like, hey, I'm going to die if I don't get something to eat. Jacob's sitting there around the campfire because he was kind of a man of the tents. And he had some stew. And, and a good brother would have went, hey, man, Esau, sit down and have something to eat, right? But Esau comes in and says, let me have something to eat. And Jacob says, well, I'll tell you what, sell me your birthright. Now, a birthright was this, is, is, is that Esau was due a double portion of his father's inheritance. So when he came in, Esau it said, despised his birthright, didn't really care about it, but he sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. But a good brother wouldn't have done that to his twin, right? Unless there's some sibling rivalry stuff going on. And so Jacob literally takes advantage of his brother at a weak moment in his life to steal his birthright from him. So obviously Esau kind of let that one go. Maybe there were some lingering kind of you know, ill feelings towards Jacob. But what happens a little bit later is, is that his mom finds out that Abraham is about to give the blessing to Esau. And she's like, no, I don't want that to happen. And so this is where parents get in trouble picking favorites in a family. Never, never a good idea, okay? But she calls Jacob aside. And she says, listen, listen, I'm going to dress you up like Esau. I'm going to cook some of your dad's favorite food. And you're going to go in and you're going to deceive your father. You're going to lie to your father in order to steal not your brother's birthright because he already had that. But now you're going to steal your brother's blessing from your father. And that's exactly what Jacob does. He goes in, he lies, he deceives, and he steals again. And Esau finds out about it and he says, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to, I'm just, I'm going to kill I'm going to wait till dad's dead, but then I'm going to kill Jacob, so Rebecca is a small family, you know, their tribe. And so, hey, you, Jacob, or Rebecca goes to Jacob, you've got to go. You go back to my family, Laban's, my dad. You go back there, you work for him. And when, and when Esau is no longer going to kill you, I'm going to call for you. Now, that's important to the story because she never calls for him. Because Esau, um, this whole time, he's like, next time I see Jacob, he's a dead man. Next time I see my brother, man, this is all over with. <laughs> you know, Dad's dead. This is going to be done. And so he goes and works for Laban, and Laban does to him what he's done to everybody else. He steals from him. He lies to him. He cheats him out of his wages. And Jacob does what he's always done. He's manipulating. He's lying. He's stealing. He's doing all those things as well. And so finally the relationship craters. It craters. And Jacob says, i got to go. He's got wives and kids by now, flocks and herds. He's like, hey, Laban's attitude towards me has changed. We got we to get out of town. And so he runs. He runs. Laban pursues him with an army. If it wouldn't have been for God intervening there, Laban would have wiped him out and taken everything back. But he, he leaves. He leaves Jacob alone. So Jacob takes all his wives, his kids, his animals, puts them over the other side of the river, Jabbok, and he stays, stays alone with God on the other side of the river. Now, being alone with God, interesting thing. When you're alone with him, uh, good things happen. Not always pleasant, not always pleasant, but, but good things happen. So here's Genesis 32, starting in verse 24. This left Jacob all alone in the camp. Everybody's on the other side of the river. And a man came, which we're going to find out a little bit in a minute, is God, in the form of a man. A man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. And the man saw that he would not win the match. He touched Jacob's hip, and he wrenched it out of his socket. The man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name, the man asked, and he replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. And Jacob says, please tell me your name. He says, why do you want to know my name? And then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means the face of God, for he said, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life was spared. And as the sun was rising, Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to, to his hip. And so a couple of teaching points from this passage. Number one is this. This is that a person's character usually follows their name, and so Jacob is a deceiver, and his character followed his name, or his name followed his character, whichever way you want to look at it, but that's who he was. He was a liar, he was a thief, he was a deceiver, and so his name was important. And the fact that God changes his name is critically important too because he changes it to Israel, or that means God conquers. And so what happens there at that point in the story, and we'll, we'll look at this in a second, is, is that actually Jacob's character has changed from one of a deceiver and a liar and a thief, the one who strives with God and overcomes. And so God changes his name because basically Jacob got saved in this passage. That's what happened with him. 
And then the other thing is this, is that the greater blesses the lesser. And so you see God taking the form of a man, wrestling with Jacob all night long, and then Jacob submitting to him, and God putting his blessing on on Jacob's life. And so we've been working through this series, and we've been in a couple of weeks now, about choices that we make, decisions that we we go through in life that that shape our, our future. So here's what happens. We all wrestle with God. And as we'll see in a minute, God wrestles with us too. Sometimes God initiates the fight with you and I. And when we go through those moments and seasons of our life, the decisions that we make and the choices that we come to along the way, they literally shape our future. And so how does wrestling with God and God wrestling with you shape yours? So there's three different time frames I want you to think about as we go through this and just, you just kind of process this as we talk. Number one is the past, and then you've got the present, and then you have the future. So there have all been times, if you've lived long enough yet, there's been times in your life in the past where you have felt like God is fighting against you. You're like, God, why are you doing this? And you have had to struggle some way, somehow or another, in your relationship with God, and you haven't had the words to really to explain, to communicate, like what was happening at that time in your life. And so there's times in our past where we have wrestled and struggled with God. You may be in the present, like in the middle of just a night of wrestling with him. God has challenged you to change, and you're fighting back. And there's this ongoing struggle between you and him at this moment. And there are choices that you are making right now that are going to shape what your future looks like. And then there's also the future as well. And those are the days that are coming that I don't know what it's going to be for me or for you. But we're going to go through those moments in our lives where we struggle with God. God initiates some sort of a battle or fight with us. And we have to make decisions and choices along the way of what that's going going to look like for us. And so at some point in your life, here's what's going to happen. You're going to get left alone with God. And that's not always pleasant. It is good, but it's not always pleasant. And it's not necessarily literal. It might mean that you're just at the end of your rope. Like sometimes we get tired of us, right? You get tired of you. You're like, God, it's just time for things to be different. It's time for things to change. Like I'm through striving. There's just something's got to give. And so you find yourself alone with God. And then you find and discover that God is actually fighting against you. Because here, here's what happens sometimes with God. And this is where you've got to be mature in your faith. You've got to you hear, hear me out on this whole thing here. Is, is that sometimes your greatest ally is also your greatest adversary. Sometimes the one that fights for you will also fight against you. That's right. Is that good? Can we do that? I mean, the answer is yes. Because there are people in your lives that you love and that you care about that you will fight for them. Because you love your wife. You love your children. You'll fight for them. But guess what? Because you love them, you will also fight against them, won't you? Your kids get off the track? I'm going to tell you. And we're going to have a fight. We're going to have a struggle. There's going to be a a, a power struggle of wills about what's going to happen right now. You fight for the people you love. You will also fight against the people you love. But it's always for their good. And so it would be wrong for me to suppose or question your love for the one you fight for or even the one you fight against. And it is wrong for you to question God's love for you when he fights both for you and also against you. Because it is always for, it's always for your good. And so we do it with each other. Sometimes we don't think about that's how God deals with us. But Jacob was left alone with God. And it's God who starts the fight. It's not Jacob. God initiates the whole thing for the good of Jacob. Now, Jacob didn't need a comforting word. Jacob didn't need for God to slide in next to him and put his arm around him and say, hey, man, it's all going to be all right. I want you to know I love you and I care about you, and we're going to make this path smooth for you. He didn't need words of reassurance. He didn't need sweet nothing spoken in his ear. That's not what Jacob needed. What Jacob needed was an all-out, all-night-long fight because he was selfish, he was prideful, 
He was full of self-will in his life. He had been running from God. He had been a liar and a cheat and a thief and a manipulator all his life. He had failed to recognize those things, refused to deal with it, and he needed God to challenge him in order to change him. Truth. We need, not all the time, because it wears out, but we need God to challenge us at moments along the way in order to change us. Because we wouldn't change otherwise. Jacob would never changed unless God had whooped him. He would never have changed. And there are some things in my life that I would never have changed unless God beat me. So it means God's going to have to beat you one day if you're going to get where he wants you to be. It is not because he doesn't love you. It's not because he doesn't care about you. It's because he does love you and he does care about you. And he will fight for you, but he will also fight against you. And those are just critical for us to know those. Those five choices that Jacob makes that we've got to make along the way. I want to show you what these are. Number one is this, is you've got to choose to wrestle. I mean, that, there's a choice in there. I mean, Jacob could just lay down. just like, hey, I'm not going to fight you. You've got to choose to wrestle with God. God came to him. He in, initiated this match with, with Jacob, and Jacob fought back with with God. There was this back and forth with God. And so sometimes for us, what do we do when, when God, you know, comes against us or challenges us in some way? We ignore him. We avoid him. We run from him. Typically, we get angry at him. We swear, I'm never going to go back to church again. I'm going to quit praying. I'm going to be an agnostic. I'm just, I'm done with all this stuff. That, that's how people respond when God challenges them in order to change them because they misunderstand the heart of God. The guy's not doing this because he doesn't love you. He's not doing this because he doesn't care about you. He's doing this because it's the only way you're going to change. Whispering sweet nothings in your ear isn't going to get it done. Putting his arm around you, that's not going to happen either. Because you're going to need a little bit something harder than that. Something that's a little bit more challenging than that. And so if God opposes us, it is for our good. Just think about friendships for a minute. If you've if you got a friend that you trust. Sometimes, it, it, sometimes it's the friend that wounds us that does us the best good because they speak truth to us when nobody else would. In Proverbs chapter 27, and verse 6, he says this, Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. So even a friend who loves you and cares about you is going to be the one that speaks truth to you, and it wounds you, and it hurts. There's nothing fun, nothing pleasant, Nothing exciting about that, but that's the best thing for us. And so you have to choose to wrestle with him. The second thing is this, second choice you've got to make is, is that you have to choose not to let go of God. Because, look, it's an all-night-long deal, man. God came, and they wrestled, and it was all the way till daybreak. He had to go through the entire night in this struggle and this battle with God. You and I, we might start it, but about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, get a little tired. You're like, God, I'm done with this. I don't want to do this anymore. And we step back and we go back to the avoidance. We go back to the, the ignoring him. We go back to the anger thing. We're like, hey, you know, you don't love me. You don't care about me. But you have to be willing to stick in the fight to learn the lessons of the battle. It says, when the man saw that he would not win the match, that's God, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. And the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. Now, that, that threw me off a little bit, you know, because it's God saying, well, when I saw that I wasn't going to win the match. The truth is God could have destroyed, absolutely smoked Jacob at any point along the way. He touched his hip and wrenched it out of the socket. What do you think he would have done to his shoulder or his elbow or his ankle? That's all God had to do. But the purpose of the fight wasn't to destroy and to crush Jacob. The purpose of the fight was to engage him in the battle to bring about the change that God wanted to bring about in his life. You guys got little boys in your house? Been around little kids? Especially the little guys, you know. About three or four, five, maybe eight, nine, you know, they start thinking they're a man. And they, I'm going to wrestle my dad. Right? And so what do we do with, with, as parents? What, what do we do with those kids when they decide that we want? Do you crush your kid? No. You don't do that. I mean, your ego may be big, but it ain't that big, I hope, right? You don't destroy your four-year-old, bah, pin him on the ground. That's just not, you don't do that with them. So what do you do, guys, when you're wrestling with your little boys in the house? What do you do? You match their strength for strength, their determination. You match that determination, match their, when they're done, you're done, right? 
If they're that strong, that's how strong you are because you know you could overpower them. You just want them to learn the lesson of the battle. You just want them to learn the lesson of, of the fight. My youngest loved the box when he was little. I'd have to get on my knees. That's how tall he was, you know, and I'd have to like punch like this because his arms are so short. <laughs> and, I mean, we, he'd have his gear on, his gloves on. I'd have my gloves on. His nose would be red, his chest all red. Where I'd punch him and hit him a few times. His mom's over in the corner going, be easy on him. You know, he's like, He's loving it because he tried to pummel me, you know, like knock me out, uppercuts. But it was good. It was good. It was good. And, and the reason why I did that was for his good, right? I, I hit him in the face. She's like, you shouldn't do that. I'm not hitting him hard, you know. <laughs> it's for his good. It's for his good. So God is the same way. Don't misunderstand God. So when you get into the battle with God, when you get into the, you got to stay in the fight to learn the lessons of the fight. You don't learn them unless you go through it. And you don't learn them until you've gone through the whole thing. It's marriage. So you got to fight if you're going to learn those lessons. Raising kids, you got to fight if you're going to learn those lessons. In your faith, you got to fight for your faith if you're going to learn those lessons. You don't learn it if you bow out. If you tap out, you don't learn those lessons. And so the real growth experiences in our life involve struggle and they involve pain. And there's no way around that. Nobody wants to talk about that, but it's true. It's true. That's what happens. So you got to get in the fight. You got to stay in the fight. Third choice that you've got to make is you've got to care enough to seek the blessing of God. Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. He said, man, I'm not, I'm not stopping until you have blessed me. So why is that so important? Why is that so important? The reason why it is so important is because we will fight for what we care about. Jacob cared enough about the blessing of God to say, I'm in this fight till it's done until you bless me. If I asked you, like, would you stay in the middle of a battle for your faith, man, and you're just suffering and there's painful and it's difficult just to receive the blessing of God, there's a lot of Christians that would go, eh, maybe, till I'm done, till I'm tired of it, till I don't want to fool with it anymore. But the truth is, is that you and I, we fight for what we care for. I care about my wife and I will fight for her. I care about my children and I will fight for them. I care about this church and I will fight for it. I care about my faith and I will fight for it. And so the things that you care about, if you care about your kids, guess what? You fight, you go to death for your children. You care about your husband, your wife, you will fight for that man and you will fight for that woman. If you care about the blessing of God, then you will fight for it. You will not stop. It doesn't matter if it's 3 o'clock in the morning. It doesn't matter if you've gone without sleep. It doesn't matter how hard it's gotten. You will not stop. You will continue the struggle until you receive the blessing from God. But in the middle of it, you've got to deal with something with you. It's the fourth choice you've got to make. You've got to admit your role in your mess which isn't always easy for us. You remember Jacob, he was a deceiver. He was a manipulator. He was a liar. He was a thief. He was all those things. He wasn't a follower of God. He was prideful. He was self-willed. He wanted to do his thing and do it his way. He was not willing to submit to God. And so God asked him in the middle of this battle, he's like, what's your name? It's kind of an odd question, right? What's your name? Jacob had to, admitting his name, Jacob understood that my name is connected to my character. When I admit my name, I'm admitting my character. And so he admitted his Character. I'm a liar, I'm a deceiver, I'm a thief. That's who I am, that's who I've been. It had taken a long time, it had taken an absolute knockdown, drag out brawl with God for him to come to terms with who he was. And so God did that for him, brought him to this point where he was willing to submit so that Jacob would see him for who he is. And so the honest truth for you and I is this. There are some days in our life, some seasons, what we need from God is not, is not a sweet word. And it's not an arm around our shoulder. It's a good whooping from him. That's what we need from him. Because that's the only thing that breaks us. It's the only thing that's broken my will. It's the only thing that's broken your will. Every one of us in here can be stubborn, and we can be prideful, and we can be selfish, 
and we can be self-willed, and we can be just, I'm going to do it my way, and I don't care how you feel, and I don't care what you think about this, and I don't care what God thinks about it, and I don't care what my parents think about it, I don't care what my husband or wife or children. We just, we just get to a point where we don't care. We're going to do whatever we want to do, and God will put you in a place where you are alone with him, and he will break you. If you'll stay in the fight, you can run. You can ignore. You can get mad Swear you'll never go to church again, never pray again, just be done with all things God. You can do that, but it's not for your good. Just remember, God brings you and initiates all these things in your life for, for your good. And that's hard to know that God initiates a fight with us in order to challenge us, in order to confront us, in order to struggle against us. But here's the harder one, that God will wound you in the process. Because God intentionally wounded Jacob, touched the hip, wrenched it out of its place. He left physically disabled to some degree for the rest of his life. God will wound you intentionally, but because he loves you and because he cares about you and because left to your own, it's not going to be pretty. Some of us walk with limps. Some of us walk with wounds, but they are for our, they're for our good. Remember, Jacob only won because he lost. I mean, that's incredibly important for us. Jacob only won because, because he lost. And there's a difference here. You know, you've got the strikes of an enemy who is against you, who is opposed to you, who only wants to harm you, and then you have the incision of surgeon. And that's the difference between the two. A couple of years ago, we were pulling the pews out of here and we were putting chairs in and we had them all outside and I was, we were hitting them with hammers because they were so big and we had to break them up. And so, I mean, I had a big hammer, right? I hit that thing and I saw that wood coming and, you know, it's just like, you can't do anything. And it hit me in the eye, cut my eye here and cut my eyeball as well. So I went to the doctor and he like sewed up the corner of my eye and he's like, hey, your eyeballs is like bleeding, you know, it's, it's got this hole in it. And so you need to go to Houston. You need to get this thing sewn up or you're going to lose your, you'll lose your eye. So I went to Houston and a guy, you know, he put me out. And, but, but here's the thing. I appreciate the knife in the hands of the right person who is for my good. But, and that, that's, that's a choice you've got to make. Do you trust God to wound you? Do you trust him with the knife. Because if you know the character of God, then you will trust the knife in his hand because you know it is for your good. Do you leave with a wound? Yeah. You can't see it, but there's a scar up there. And I got stitches in my eyeball still. And it'll be there till the day that I die. And if somebody finds my body 500 years from now, that stitch will still be there because I think it's synthetic. It doesn't go away. But I appreciate the guy with the knife in his hand because it's for my good. But when you're living that out with God, that's, that's tough. You got to trust him even when he, even when he wounds you. Job said this, he said, though I slay, though he slay me, I will hope in him. That was Job's saying. I mean, he was saying the same thing. It's like, even though you wound me, God, I'm, I'm going to trust you. Even though, even though some tough things has gone on in my life, God, I, I'm not walking away. I'm staying in the fight. I'm not leaving the fight. Not until you bless me. And so how does wrestling with God shape your future? Blessing comes only after the struggle. We want the blessing, right? We want to go down to the store, buy a lottery ticket, get rich, and not have to work a bit. That's what we want. That's easy. That's easy. That's what we want from God. We want to go down to the store and buy a ticket from God and say, God, bless me. I don't want to have to learn the pain, the suffering, the wounds. I don't want to have to go through the struggle. I don't want to have to go through the fight. I don't want to have to stick it out all night long. I don't, I don't want to have to do it. I don't want to have to admit who I am and what I've done and who I've been. I don't want to have to go through all those things in my life. But that's not how it works. That is not how it works. The blessing only comes after the struggle. He says, please tell me your name, Jacob said. And God asked back, why do you want to know my name? And then he blessed Jacob there. The blessing did not come until after the struggle. So you go back to those three time frames. We're going to finish it up here. You got the past, you got the present, you got the future. Maybe there is something that is in your past that you've been struggling with interpreting. Like what, 
was that all about? I mean, you literally felt like God was fighting against you. You were struggling back with God. You're here in church. That's great. Obviously, you've stuck it out and stayed the course, but still you didn't have words to express. Like, what was going on there? I don't understand it. Now you do. Now you do. Now you know what God was trying to accomplish. You can probably see that. You may be in the middle of a long night of battle, just wrestling with God, and you needed some words to kind of help you explain what's happening. Now you know. Now you know the choices that you're going to make along the way and how those are going to shape your future. And there'll come those days that we all struggle with God and wrestle with him and over something he wants to change in us, a place where he wants to bring us that we wouldn't come without the fight. But at least when that happens, now you've got some context for, what, for what's going on. So I want to pray for you. I want to pray for us. I want to pray that God give you wisdom to deal with what's going on now with you in the past and prepare you for the future. Let's pray.